Uh, sometime in New York City, the album was recorded, I think, in 1970 or 1971. It was a very political album, almost a, a scrapbook or a document that reflected some of the changes that were going on in uh, post-America 1960s. And it dealt with such things as Attica State, which is a prison in the East Coast where there was a huge uprising where many people, um, inmates, primarily, but I think um, prison guards as well, were killed. It dealt with Angela Davis, who was a college professor at uh, a college in California who uh, indicated that she was a Marxist or a communist, and there was discussion as to whether or not she should be allowed to teach. It dealt with uh, Richard Nixon. It dealt with the war. It dealt with all of those 60s issues. Uh, and on the cover was a the picture of a kind of a computerized picture of President Nixon and Chairman Mao Zedong dancing nakedly. It was a kind of bizarre album. I mean, folks, if you can create a controversial album in the 70s, John and Yoko did it with this record. When I met them, he had an acetate recording, a test pressing of the record. I was on a radio station in Los Angeles, an ABC affiliate called KLOS, doing a nighttime music talk show. And he said, look, you're the first guy we're giving this to. You can take this and bring it to the radio station and play it. And it's yours exclusively. And I thought, well, wowie, zowie. You know, this was fantastic. This was the first day I met them. Um, I still have the acetate. They autographed it to me. And I left Ojai and I drove the 60 miles back to Los Angeles and I went right back to this ABC-owned radio station and I said, folks, I've got something really special for you tonight. Hold the commercials, hold everything. Here's John and Yoko's brand new album. It's called Sometime in New York City, which I had not listened to, of course. <laughs> and uh, gave it to the engineer. He put it on the turntable. Uh, he pushed play. And it played with all of those songs and all of that imagery. And um, the... The record played, the show ended, I went home. Uh, the next day I called uh, John and I said, well, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. They, of course, couldn't find the radio station on their uh, FM machine. And I said, the good news is I played the entire album without any commercial breaks. And the bad news is I was fired, which he found incredibly amusing. He could not stop laughing. I, I guess in his mind he thought, well, this was the ultimate testament to the power of the album, that it so shook, quote, the establishment that they didn't want it played, that this was a success. He told Yoko the story, and she found it amusing as well. And I said, well, uh, look, um, I'm glad the two of you find it amusing, but I'm out of a job. He said, oh, Come, come with us. We're going to drive up to San Francisco uh, tomorrow. Uh, you, you just come with us and hang with us. You got, you got nothing better to do. And I thought to myself, in 1971, an out-of-work disc jockey, hmm, I had nothing better to do. So we went to San Francisco. We spent a week there, and we really got to know each other. We stayed at a hotel called the Miyako. We got to know each other really, really, really well. And a month or two later, I met them in Japan, spent months with them, and from 71 to 80, uh, they were my extended family. I don't know what would have happened if sometime in New York City had become Abbey Road and was really a, you know, a, a hit, and I just got the exclusive, and I'd probably still be playing records somewhere in Los Angeles. That's probably what would have happened. <laughs>